Good morning. I'm Gordon Smith, the Gov Governor's uh, Director of Opioid Response. I really appreciate you all being uh, here today with us for one of our monthly webinars that we'll continue to offer every month right up until the 2022 Governor's Summit, which we hope to hold in Bangor on July 11th. Today, our topic is staying connected from a distance, how to build and maintain therapeutic relationships using telehealth. We've got, uh, we had well over 200 people register and we really appreciate uh, all the interest in this important treatment uh, topic. We've got a great team to, um, that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, in the way of housekeeping, I would just say that if you have a question, put it in the question and answer room as opposed to the chat room. I'll monitor that during the uh, program and uh, get the questions to the panelists. And then we will try to have at least five or 10 minutes for questions at the end as well. Um, and our January program, we haven't got a topic yet, um, but um, it will be as always the first Friday in, um, in uh, January, 11.30 to 12.30. So appreciate you being with us. Uh, I'll be with you for the full hour. And um, without further uh, comments, I will introduce uh, our lead uh, presenter today, uh, Jesse Higgins. Jesse is the Director of Integrated Behavioral, uh, Behavioral Health at Northern Light Acadia Hospital. Um, she has been an Acadia provider since 2010. She is both, both, has both an RN, a Master's of Nursing. She's a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, really had a, an outstanding career since uh, she started at, at Acadia in 2010. She's also, she's practiced consultative psychiatry in a family medicine practice at Eastern Maine since 2011. Joining her is Brittany Barker, who she will introduce, and Lisa Jacobs. They both have, uh, all, this is, I don't think I'm overstating it to say that this is the best team that we could put together to present this topic. The, the Acadia has done a wonderful job advancing the interest of telehealth in Maine and during the COVID period um, and the, the ability to help people with substance use disorder through telehealth uh, is one of the keys to expanding access in Maine and indeed across the country. So Jesse, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce your team and um, thanks for doing this one. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, so I, uh, this is my team. So we have a program of integrated behavioral health at Acadia and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but our lead clinical supervisor who oversees all of the licensed clinical social workers who do integrated therapy in the practices is Brittany Barker. She is an LCSW um, and has lots of experience um, in private practice, in community mental health, and um, in integrated behavioral health, where she now leads a team all across the state. And we also have Lisa Jacobs, who's our integrated clinical supervisor over our psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners. And we do have a program of um, integrated psychiatric medication management that's also integrated into a number of practices across the state, um, including primarily uh, primary care, but also pediatrics, um, oncology, women's health, and some other specialties. Um, and so we'll talk about more about that in the system, but I'll share my slides. In the interest of being true to the nature of this topic, I will not read slides aloud to you <laughs> in a monotone, but we will um, look at them together and sort of use them to keep me on track so I don't go off the rails. All right, so I'm assuming let me get this on and from the right place. You Can you see my slides? It looks like it's not slideshow. We can see the slide, it's just not in slideshow mode yet. Yeah, I don't know why. Oh, resume slideshow. There we go, slideshow mode. There Thank you, you very much. Perfect. So 
this is, just shows you for integrated behavioral health, with, which is the program that I direct and that Lisa and Brittany lead clinically. Um, this is where we see patients currently all across the state. So you can see that we work for Northern Light Health. Acadia is the lone psychiatric hospital in the Northern Light Health system. Um, but we also have a number of partnerships external to Northern Light Health. And we have a combination of um, supervising folks in a few cases that actually work directly for those organizations. And um, for the most part, we have Acadia employed clinicians and providers who work through a contract in a contracted role. So you can see down here on the lower right, this little key shows you who's on site and who has telepsychiatry. Most of them, there are a combination um, because it, during the pandemic, even in places like Bangor and um, Waterville and um, Portland that, that are more populated, we still are doing a lot of telehealth just in the interest of keeping patients and staff safe. And for behavioral health, we know that the evidence is really strong that supports um, tel using telehealth for uh, our specialty. So a lot of the folks who are in the, the medical practices where we're integrated really need that kind of hands-on face-to-face contact with patients. And if we step out of the practice, that gives them some more space to maneuver around safely. Um, that being said, many of us, including Lisa, um, we're doing telehealth long before the pandemic. Um, Lisa was actually our first uh, adventurer into the world of telehealth um, several years ago. And we were leading a virtual team before the pandemic also using Zoom, because even for those of us who are, lo are physically located in state, even those of us who see patients in practices, we're all over the place because we're in Blue Hill where, I mean, you can see by this map, whether people are physically located on site or not, our team needs to be virtual. So we've learned a lot about communicating virtually. And that's really what we'll talk about here is how to apply those topics to patients. So we're talking about authentic virtual engagement, which is different than um, the general concept of telehealth. It's really making those connections. And we'll talk a little bit about the hesitancy people have feeling like there's something, some sort of humanness lost um, in this way of connecting with other people. And for those of you who are in, have 10 hour days like we do of being on Zoom all day, you'll know that Zoom fatigue is a thing and it does get tiring. And I would say that if you were face-to-face -face right in front of a human being for 10 hours in a row on, on site, that would also be tiring. So I think there is something to be said for just constantly interacting face-to-face -face with people can be tiring. Um, and then learning how to adapt um, our communication style to engage with not just the patient, but their treatment team, the patients, their families, and specifically, we're talking today about patients with substance use disorders. This is not just about opioid use disorder, and I would say really not just about substance use disorders, because a lot of the people we collaborate with are medical assistants, are people who are um, on, the, on the other end of things located where the patient is or even in a, another location. And then so just being effective. Here again, just looking at the all of the virtual, um, the ways that we're connecting with patients virtually. The map on the left shows you where the providers are located. This isn't just for integrated behavioral health, but all the programs that Acadia has, including consult liaison, um, psychiatry, were integrated into a number of emergency departments across the state. And um, you can see over here on the right, it shows you the inpatient consultations, uh, the pediatric residential services, all of the ways that we use telehealth at Acadia. So barriers to telehealth. And really, I mean, this is a long list, but there's a lot of assumptions that people have that they assume would be barriers to telehealth. And some of them that come up most often are privacy concerns, um, concerns that people with substance use disorders, OUD, meaning opioid use disorder, SUD, substance use disorders, apologies for the lack of explanation there. But really that they wouldn't be able to use this kind of medium. They wouldn't have access to the resources they need to do this. Or really that bottom one is the big one, that there's a lack of therapeutic rapport. You can't build relationships by Zoom that you don't already have. And then some benefits that we know are, you know, 
really changing the game for patients who are reaching out. We'll talk more about specific instances here, but really these social determinants of health we've been talking about for many, many years, that especially in a rural state like Maine, especially in an older state like Maine, where we have so many caregivers, such difficult weather for much of the year, uh, so much childcare issues, people trying to get out of work. So the barriers that telehealth addresses really affect people at all ends of the socioeconomic spectrum, we find that we're seeing not only a lot more patients who would ordinarily miss appointments or struggle to get to appointments because of childcare, transportation issues, things like that, but we're seeing professionals who can't get the time off from work, who are busy raising their families, volunteering, working full-time jobs or multiple jobs, and they're able to see us, you know, from their excavators, from in the, the teacher's, um, you know, break room at the school or, you know, in a hospital on a, on a break from nursing. And we know how stressful those positions are right now and how important it is for those folks to be able to access mental health appointments um, and substance use disorder appointments. And then overcoming the challenge of staff turnover, I can tell you now we do a lot of interviewing. There are not a lot of applicants for on-site positions, almost none. Not quite none, but almost none. <laughs> so we've had some positions open for quite some time. And when we are able to be flexible with those positions and offer them as either telehealth or a hybrid between telehealth and on site, we find that the um, applications come flooding in because what a lot of providers and clinicians learned over the having an opportunity to do telehealth during the pandemic is that they love it, that their work-life balance is much more easily achieved. They feel like there's a lot less wasted time just walking and driving between places, able to just move from one um, appointment to the next and less concerned about um, things like no-shows and, and uh, other similar concerns. So I'm going to hand off to Brittany for a minute to talk about the concerns that patients and providers sometimes have around telehealth and how she manages those and maybe tell us a little bit about her role in the practices and how she uses telehealth. Thanks, Jesse. So yeah, um, like Jesse has already mentioned, our team has always and it will always be primarily remote. So starting from, you know, day one to the end of treatment or the initial interview for an employee till hopefully never, hopefully they never leave us, but it does happen sometimes. So um, we are remote. And so that just means in, in my world that I have to be really intentional about my use uh, and my interaction with my employees and my uh, patients or clients or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so that really means to me slowing down from the very beginning, starting in our interview process or our assessment process and connecting deeply on just a human level. And often that may mean not getting to talk about some of the traditional things that we would initially want to focus on, like the end game of treatment, like what is the goal here? What let's talk immediately about your substance use or let's talk about like your career goals, but it means slowing down and learning about this patient uh, and this employee or this potential employee um, and doing that from the beginning, I have found and in all I can speak to is my experience that I get to really know them on a really solid level. I, I get to understand them as a person first and foremost. And something that stood out to me over the past two years, uh, whenever I feel like from, you know, my employee or from my patient, this sort of outdated idea of resistance, right, to resistance to treatment or resistance to using telehealth, um, because I've gotten to know them already before we get there, I, I'm able to understand that really what's underlying is anxiety or fear or worry. And so we spend a significant amount of time in the beginning stages of treatment uh, talking about anxiety, talking about what is it that's got you feeling? What, what's worrying you on just a human level about providing treatment to someone um, via telehealth or just someone with a substance use disorder in general? I think clinicians sometimes can be pretty anxious about that in my experience. And so it's slowing down and listening to them. And as an example, a result of that with my team has been that we started having a monthly consultation with someone 
from the system who is amazing and is really excited about treating substance use disorders and using telehealth and really loves it. And we can meet with her uh, monthly and talk about our just human fears as just people. Uh, what are we worried about? What are we feeling insecure about? Uh, there's no judgment. She, you know, she's sort of our peer. There's no dynamic of power. Uh, we just get to be human and flawed and connect and sort of uh, join as a team in that way. Uh, and so I think treating our patients, it's much similar. You know, I don't know any patient that's ever come to me and is just resistant. It's it's from fear, right? More often than not, it comes from a place of anxiety. And so weaving that into their treatment, and it may mean starting over the phone initially uh, and developing a trusting relationship where they can tell me their truths. They can be kind of transparent and weaving into our goals, sort of the next step may be using telehealth. Um, but thinking about the reason that someone, you know, initially started to struggle with an addiction or a use disorder, it often in my experience comes from a place of anxiety. So how do we leave that out? We have to make that a part of our conversation. Thank you so much. I... So when we talk about this um, authentic communication, which is really what Brittany is talking about here is with employees, with patients, how to be authentic and present with people. I mean, this is obviously relevant to everything, not just telehealth, but it's especially hard in telehealth. And we'll talk about why there are some challenges and there are some reasons that people perceive it as less than authentic and why we can come across as less than connected to other people. These are just the elements generally, telehealth aside, of authentic communication. What you believe, what you think, and what you do have to all be aligned. We can all tell you anyone who, well, I mean, anyone who works in uh, behavioral health or really with people <laughs> can tell you that people know when you when what you're saying is not consistent with who you are and what you believe. There is an almost unfair burden of moral courage on those of us who do this work because we really have to believe, uh, know ourselves and uh, be able, You, I don't think you can connect with other people in an authentic way if you're not comfortable with who you are as a person. That doesn't mean you love every aspect of who you are as a person, but it means you know who you are and you're comfortable um, with that. So some of the the just tricks of, of um, authentic engagement by telehealth are openly inviting engagement from other people, like saying it out loud. You know, Brittany referenced um, people sometimes feeling uncertain about telehealth when they start treatment, and she's inviting them to have a conversation about that and making that part of the treatment. So, you know, what what does make you nervous? Why were you hesitant to do this? How can, you know, making it okay to talk about that, that that's not like a forbidden topic. And I think that is really key is making it clear um, that, and, and directly addressing something that seems to be an elephant in the room. I think that's a really good way of, of opening a relationship. Choosing your medium carefully, we'll talk a little bit more about that and why that's so important. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead just because I think that it is really important that we know that the way we communicate comes across uh, visual is 55% of communication of how people accurately interpret communication. Sound is 38% and text is only 7%. So choosing your medium means that I know, we'll, and we'll talk about patient portals. A lot of us have patient portals now who work in healthcare. They're wonderful for a million reasons. I will say as a patient, I greatly appreciate not being on hold for 45 minutes when I need a medication refill or to have a quick conversation with somebody in the practice. But that's all it's really good for to some extent or a simple exchange back and forth, a patient concern, and then we respond to that. But then if there's a misunderstanding, then it's time to communicate with the patient by phone or in another way, because text is 7% of communication and you're, you're not able to get across a nuanced message that's going to address a complex concern in text. Um, sometimes it magically does work, but I, my rule of thumb is if something's gone back and forth more than once, it's time to do something different, make a call, make a connection in another way. Um, so that's 
clear about messaging. I think just being, I think this is true of meetings and with patient appointments. Why are we here? What are we working on? What are we doing right now? I always say to people and to patients in the beginning of a session, I might have an idea, like we really need to talk about, you know, your substance use since you were here last time. But really the best way for me to open with patients is to say, this is your visit. This is your space. I'm here to support you. What would you like to focus on today? If we focus on one thing today, what would be the most important thing? Because we have 20 minutes of our appointment often once the patient's met with the MA, gotten situated, been roomed. I want them to be aware we have this much time. What is the priority? What do we need to focus on today? And um, I know we in medicine a lot of times call that chief complaint, which I kind of wish we wouldn't because it's not a complaint. It's, it's, it's what somebody would like to focus on in their time with us, which is why they're here. So I don't know why we call that a complaint, but it, the, the reality is, um, you know, the patient should be driving the appointment. And I also often will say to people, you know, you are an expert on yourself. I will never know as much about you as you know about yourself. And I have some clinical expertise. So let's create, let's talk about what we want to focus on. Let's, let's, it, whether it's little goals for the session or bigger goals, things that we want to work on long term. And then we'll carve a path together. We might not always agree on how we want to get there, and that's okay. Ultimately, we, we will come to a shared understanding of how we get to the end. What I want to be really clear on is that. Shared decision making is talked about in medicine a lot in terms of all sorts of, um, you know, back pain, medical decisions. I want to be really clear that it applies equally and perhaps more importantly to people working with patients with substance use disorders. That doesn't mean that you're offering somebody a controlled substance that you know that is unsafe for them as part, or if a patient asks for that, that that has to drive your decision making. But it does mean that they are allowed to <laughs> vocalize what they think would be the best treatment for themselves. And you have a conversation about that. There is nothing that can't be talked about. You put it on the table and that gives you an opportunity to really explain why you think a different course of treatment might be more effective, what concerns you have about that course of treatment, if that's the direction things are, the way things are going. What I found is that when we approach, whether it's telehealth or in person, these decisions as in, in terms of shared decision-making is that even if a patient with a substance use disorder comes in seeking a medication that I don't feel is safe for them, they will come back. They might get mad, they might leave, they might have been seeking something that they were not able to get in that appointment initially. But I always say to people, you are more than welcome to come back and see me anytime you like. I see that you're anxious. To Brittany's point, we see the underlying you know, struggle that you're having. And I know you need support and I'm willing to walk with you through this. We can walk through this together and people will come back because they, they don't get that a lot. And, and we should get that more. I mean, patients with substance use disorders and families affected by substance use disorders should be able to walk into any setting, particularly any medical setting and be warmly welcomed and be able to talk about their substance use along with all of the other behaviors that we all have that affect our healthcare. And we should feel comfortable having those conversations. And I will say that there's a lot of folks I know that are not comfortable with that. And we are, and those, those of us who are here on this call are more than happy, please feel free to reach out anytime. And we are more than happy to work with you and your team to help folks script those conversations, learn more about substance use disorders, and really become more comfortable with those conversations, because I think that is just critical to our recovery as a community from this epidemic. Um, this is me totally violating this rule of never talking for more than a few minutes without um, engaging people. <laughs> I am talking at you for like a full 50 minutes, so sorry, but ideally that's not what I'm doing in a session. Um, we're asking people what we should focus on. What are their concerns? How can I support your recovery? People need to carve their own recovery path. Everyone has their own ideas. I'm sure I do too about how we would like people's recovery to look. 
what kind of support we think they need. And we can offer those things to people, but ultimately it's their recovery and it's our job to support them along that path with as many options as possible. Um, just remembering that when you're online, again, there you've got to balance the different ways of communicating. Um, emails and portal for facts, not feelings, really driving that home, but it's important because the research tells us that people tend to assign negative content to text and we tend to send text with um, to communicate negative messages when we're not comfortable doing that um, in person. And it's funny because we are in this leadership team talk about this all the time because uh, often we will send a message to one another <laughs> before sending it to somebody else. Think, how does this sound? And we're gonna be like, maybe not right now do you want to send that message maybe because it's really hard to hide the subtext it's in there you might I, I will sometimes read my own message back to myself but of course the tone I'm reading it back in is lovely um and that is not what you know if I if I am, am at all flushed in the face I have no business writing an email to anybody so these are the things that um, are important to bear in mind. And I think most of us who have had any kind of work um, in the last 10 years have learned that email can be problematic. Also, Lisa always says, and I support 100%, do not reply to all. Reply to, replying to all is almost never, almost never a thing that you should do. Very, very rarely. I think it um, needs special permission. You need special permission to be able to use that button. Yeah, she should have to take a class and get a certification, a reply to all certification. I like that idea. I think it's a good one. It would solve a lot of problems. Remember, if your patient or, or a colleague can't see or hear you, they will assign tone and motivation. So if it's not going to be really clear what that is, um, then it will be really clear what that is. Um, clarification. Again, this is the reason why email and portal communication is limited, because you can't manage people's responses you can't clarify if you can't see if somebody is misinterpreting or correctly interpreting something that you um, have included that you want to be able to manage so it, it, it is just important to clarify especially since we know that virtual communication is limited a lot of us i mean we're still in a place although my understanding is funding is coming to support uh, bandwidth expansion we still have many folks in the state who are needing to communicate with us by phone because that's the only way that they're going to access their behavioral health care. And that's hard. It's hard for the provider for the reasons we've discussed earlier. Now you've lost the visual as well. And all we've got is audio. So um, it, it's in those appointments in particular, paying very careful attention, asking clarifying questions, um, making sure that people have time, allowing for silence. Oh, we talk about this a lot too. That's very important in therapy sessions and in appointments, but it's also important in meetings, um, especially big meetings, because there's a lot of people that if you give it, and, and that's important to say at the beginning, especially in like a family therapy session or in a team meeting for a patient to say, sometimes we're going to stop for a minute and and give people a chance to think because it takes some people longer to just process and decide what they want to say sometimes people need to be specifically invited to participate in a conversation and they're not that they're not going to just jump right in and so really setting the tone of the meeting um, and the and the kind of ground rules for how we're going to interact so that people aren't caught off guard i will say that in meetings that we have with our virtual team we always say that we have most of those meetings during lunchtime. I don't care if people eat during, I hope people do eat. We all need to eat. So we, we make that really clear that that's one of our norms. That's not true in every meeting, but um, in ours, it always is. And I will say that to patients too. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later. I know Lisa has some examples of um, patients who, you know, kind of deviated from those norms and it turned out to be helpful in, in therapy. Um, virtual healthcare means you must work harder to be human. Your patient must know you. This just comes with the authentic, all of the things that we're talking about, being authentic and real with patients, even if they don't, they just mean they don't have to like what you're saying <laughs> or like the recommendations that you make. There's a book called Radical Candor that is like my authentic communication Bible. I, I send it to everyone. I, I talk about it all the time because it's really about the idea there is that you are being completely candid, but compassionate. 
So you are giving feedback, and I believe in this absolutely with patients being honest, being straightforward and direct, but being kind. Uh, not nice. I feel like nice is different. I don't like nice as much. Being kind and real with people. Uh, shared humanity. The, the big piece, and I, it's funny because I was doing a lecture with some medical students yesterday, and we talked all about diagnosing depression and treating depression and all of these different clinical pathways. And I said, really, if there's one take home from anything you learn here, it, it's that humanity is where shared humanity is where healing happens. If you remember nothing else, if you're an ED doc running from room to room, if your day is gone, if you can stop for one minute, two minutes, slow down, look somebody in the eye, let them know in some way that you see them as a human being, not just in this worst moment of crisis, but that you as a human being see them as a human being and care what happens to them, that can be life changing. So this is what we're talking about here is being able to do that using telehealth. Um, humor is good when it's when it makes sense. Um, your vocal changes, we've all attended webinars and various um, meetings where people talk in a monotone the entire time. Um, that's pretty rugged for anyone <laughs> to sit through. Um, it's just not, it, it, I, use changing your vocal tone. I mean, you're, you think about, you know, it's not really that normal to have long conversations, just one-on-one -on -one staring people in the face for long periods of time. So you kind of have to go, we find like we do a lot of interviewing and we find that when we interview people, you can kind of tell right away if they'll be good with telehealth because they just come through the screen. And it doesn't mean you have to be loud or you have to be like, like super over the top, but there's just something more animated um, about some people and it, it just works better for telehealth. And that doesn't mean that you can't learn those skills because you can. If you are not naturally a sort of animated person practicing, using your volume, changing up your tone, um, remember, you know, be, just being careful to not be um, flat in appointments, smiling, positive language, telling a little story. There, there's all sorts of ways to bring the fact that you are a human being back in uh, using an electronic um, medium. I'm gonna pass off. So I do wanna say that of the three of us, Lisa is the only one who is seeing patients using medication assisted treatment. Um, and she practices in Eastport and in, in a rural health center. Um, I do wanna say that we are talking here in this talk about uh, the, how authentic communication and telehealth um, facilitate those interactions. So not so much on the technical questions of medication assisted treatment and telehealth, but really wanting uh, Lisa to talk a bit about her experience in working with patients with opioid and other substance use disorders for such a long time, really using telehealth. Thank you. Um... So I really feel like this pandemic has been horrible in some ways, which we all know, but, but certainly there has been one thing for psychiatry that has been so dynamically changing. I now can see my patients wherever they're at. And before I would get phone calls such as, you know, such as such canceled his, his appointment because he was too depressed to come. Well, that's what I need to see you. I need to see you when you're depressed. Now I can say, it's okay. He can't come to the office. Let me meet him halfway. I'm going to see if I can meet him in his, in his home instead. You know, patients that were having panic disorder so bad that they were throwing up in the trash can as they got into the office because they were in the middle of a panic attack. I now see him at home and he doesn't, he's nowhere near as anxious. One of the, um, the nurse practitioners that I was rounding with last uh, this last year uh, was telling me about a patient that she was meeting that had substance use disorder. The patient was clearly struggling and, and, and you know, the, the practitioner knew that, but in the appointment, the patient got so distraught that she walked out of the, out of the house. She had the phone. She was doing the Zoom with phone. She walked out of the house and instead of lighting a cigarette, she started smoking crack. And the practitioner stopped for a second and kind of looked at her and said, do you see what you're doing? And the patient was absolutely oblivious to the fact that she was smoking crack. Now, in an office situation, we would never see this. No one would come in and light a, light a crack pipe in the, in the office. But it was a chance for that practitioner to have such an engaged opportunity and moment. And that's what it was. She said, you know, oh my goodness, I am so 
glad that I got to see this. I now know how much you've been struggling. I can see it. Let's start from here. What an opportunity. And it was so humanistic. It was non-judgmental. And the patient, you know, was, was appreciative. She was mortified that she did it, obviously. I have two patients in, that I, I wanted to share with you. One of them is a younger uh, male, single, mid-20s. When I heard about him and I was going to get him for treatment, I was told that he was very difficult, always psychotic, always agitated, utilized a lot of substances. One time he was psychotic because he was under medicated for a schizoaffective disorder, but was also using active psycho, um, psychodynamic illicit substances, went into the emergency room and basically trashed it. Doesn't remember doing it, ended up in jail. So I was challenged with, I'm going to see him by telehealth. Well, I'm from Indiana. So there's strike one because people automatically assume I'm from away. So I have to establish with them, by the way, I graduated from Woodland High School. I am as much Washington County as anybody else. And I probably know some of your relatives and you probably know some of mine. Um, with him, we started engaging by telehealth. He would come into the office. And he would get a little cantankerous sometimes with staff because he was, he was maybe withdrawing. He was just not, he was hearing voices or whatnot. So I allowed for some flexibility and we had conversations together about, okay, how are we gonna make this work? Anyway, um, what would happen was he would come in and he started to relax. Sometimes our appointments were short or whatnot, but since I have engaged with him in this manner through telehealth, because I'm not there physically imposing on him in any way, he's never had a psychiatric hospitalization since. He's on antipsychotic medications. The voices are still there, but they're manageable. He has not used any heroin except for when he's mad. And he says, it's all or nothing thinking. We've talked about that. He knows that now. It's all or nothing thinking. When I'm mad, I know I use, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on that. And he said to me, a couple of weeks ago, you know, I actually like coming to these appointments. It floored me. I did not expect that at all. So he's doing better. It's a work in progress. Um, my other patient, who also I treat with Suboxone, um, has some illicit slips every now and then. We work on it. I am very calm in my approach to him. Um, much like I would be if I was in the room with him. And what he said to me is, he said, I don't think you understand. Cause I, I had asked him a question. He had, he had used uh, something and it, I'm concerned about him. I'm like, you're using something that, that has made you aggressive in the past. And you know, you have kids, I'm worried about that. And he said, you know, you're the only provider that I've ever come to twice. I've always never made it past that second appointment. I've been treating him for two years now. And so there's that possibility that we can engage with them as long as we're real. And he's the one that said, it's like you're, you're here, but you're not, you know, I get that. And, and so it was, it, it's been incredibly rewarding, obviously. To do MAT, the thing that is absolutely necessary, if you're doing telehealth, obviously there are some things I'm going to be, I'm going to miss. I don't smell alcohol. I don't smell pot. When they come in, I don't necessarily see that they're sweating. I can see that they might be a little jittery if they're in withdrawal. I depend on my MA for that. When I started at Eastport Healthcare in this contract, it was, it was imperative that I establish a relationship with that staff. I, I said to, to them from the get-go, I am here to help you. I'm here to help your patients. I will do whatever I need to do. And this, this the only barrier that I have is I'm not there to quickly run down the hall. But what I have done, even with the team that I that I supervise, um, you know, I have I think 14, almost 16 uh, psych NPs in the state. If someone asks me, "Hey, do you have a minute?" That doesn't mean, "Do you have a minute to read my email and respond?" Do you have a minute to do my IM? I'm like, absolutely. Let's zoom right now, so that they can ask a question to me in person. So when my MA and I are trying to figure something out for an MAT patient, if it like Jesse said, if it goes back more than once, once or twice. I say, can you Zoom me real quick? And she comes in, or if I'm, I, I sent an email that says, yeah, okay, do that. I, I, I look at it really quick and go, oh wait, that sounded terse. Can you come in so that I can have the conversation with you so that you can see my face and, and things like that. So those are the things that, that really, really matter. I, it, for MAT, I think it has been imperative for me to be able to do telehealth because when these guys don't show up, 
I can go to them and say, hey, what's the deal? How come you couldn't come into the office today? And they'll say, I was having, I, I couldn't get out of work. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Okay, well, I'm still going to write your script because I'm not going to stop the Suboxone script. But can you come in tomorrow for me and get the urine drug screen that I need and do the count? They're like, yeah, sure. No problem. It allows us to be flexible. And really, it's not chasing patients. We're meeting them halfway. They don't always have to come into my office and do things my way. So that's what telehealth I think is done. And I just want to add one more thing because I could go on about this. And by the way, when I get wound up, my, my tell is my, my right ear gets red. So um, it's red. Um, on Jesse's, um, when Jesse was talking about Radical Candor, not only is that a fantastic book and I highly recommend it, they actually have a podcast by Kim Scott on Spotify and it's, it's definitely worth the listen. I think it's made our team more cohesive. And I think the people that we supervise and we interact with on a professional level, whether it be through contracts or even patients, I think that radical candor approach is phenomenal. So that's all I've got. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So let's see. So yeah, I, I, what this all comes down to is, is shared humanity, is putting shared humanity back into the patient-clinician relationship, but not only the patient-clinician relationship, the relationship we have with one another, with our colleagues, with people who work for us. You know, we interview people a lot um, for these positions, and we at this point always say at some point in the interview, because people say, well, what are your productivity expectations? What are your, what are the hours? But, and we always, our job as leaders in a healthcare in, environment is to take care of our employees, is to take care of the providers and clinicians so that they can take care of patients. That's what people want to do. They want to feel taken care of. Thing, there is a, a shortage, uh, as everybody I'm sure is aware, of employees in Maine. We have one out of five people in healthcare has entirely left the field of healthcare in the last year. One out of five. What the reason people are leaving isn't because they're not making enough money or because you know the hours aren't right. I mean, I'm sure in some cases that's true, but for the most part it's because we're missing the humanity. We, we can't, we have to, the technology has to be a vehicle for connecting to one another. I almost immediately in the beginning of the pandemic when they started saying social distancing was like, like recoiled from that phrase because it was so obviously immediately the last thing. And we immediately talked about physical distancing. You have to be physically distant from people, socially connected. And I think that picked up more as time went on, but it, it really has never been a good, <laughs> term because that was the problem before the pandemic, right? That we weren't socially connected. We were socially distant. And I do want to take a second to say social media is not as often the opposite of being connected with other human beings. And that is why it, the, the, all the ugliness, the vitriol, we spend a lot of time with patients, with colleagues, with one another, working through that stuff too, because right, it's like another crisis to deal with on top of all the other things in the world is how paralyzingly, you know, separate, separated everyone is into different kinds of boxes and categories. We really need to do, I mean, I would, I, it's, I almost, it's funny that just thinking about this, I was thinking about the other day on Giving Tuesday when, you know, there's a lot of, of organizations asking for charitable donations, rightly, because that's what, you know, nonprofits and charitable organizations need. But I was thinking about like all the people seeing all of those messages and questions who can't afford to contribute in that way financially, and that it's probably difficult to see your sort of social media flooded with those asks from organizations you wish you could support in that way. And I really hope that we, you know, take some time to appreciate the way that we all give to one another, because I think we need to celebrate every moment that we are able to be non-judgmental, to connect with somebody with a different philosophy, with a different perspective than we have, different background, 
um, and just see them as another human being. Um, I think that is the way that we all heal. And I know that that's a little bit beyond the topic of what we're talking about right now, but I, I do think it's important to talk about because technology can help us or it can take us all down, man. <laughs> we can, it's, it's all human driven, right? It's our best instincts and our worst instincts coming across in all sorts of ways and we can use it however we choose. But I think what we want to talk about today are some ways that we found it to be really helpful to strengthen and build our connections to fellow human beings and hopefully in some small way contribute to um, addressing the opioid epidemic, the substance use epidemic, and the impact that these things are having on our communities and on the lives of the people in Maine. So I don't know if there are any questions, but that is the, that's the, bulk of our content there, there are questions uh, oh good Jessie, can you hear me can you hear I me can. there are three there are three questions and thank you for the, the presentations that was great i'm so proud that we have three washington county people with us Brittany, lisa and myself i'm only one generation removed jesse is from away of course but it makes her no less uh, uh, capable and, and important in this discussion thank you um so the, the, <laughs> you're welcome. I lived in. Well, I need to say, I need to say Gordon, that when yeah. when I talk to patients, when I talk to patients, I always ask them what the weather is. But I had called my aunt who lives in Washington County. She's 92. I I know what the weather is because she told me the night before. You know, and I tell them that. So those are the things that we do to engage, especially in Washington County. Connect. We are all connected. Um, the first question. Is, this is a great one. Um, the and you, you can read it in the chat, but I'll I'll um, read it to you. I love the idea of going slow and at the pace of clients. However, our system in quotes uh, makes it very difficult to do that because of billing and insurance requirements to get specific documentation done within a tight timeline. What is your recommendation when it comes to completing consents, intakes, treatment plans? within the 30 days we're given while effectively connecting and building a rapport with the clients. So I toss that out to any of you. I can talk about that a little bit. I think Brittany would be a good one to talk about that though, actually. So I'm gonna turf that one to you, Brittany, because I, I think you, you have a good handle on that. Oh, I hear you. Oh, I hear you. Um, that being said, I do, our, I feel really, I feel a lot of, uh, gratitude that our program has really weeded out what is not absolutely mandatory for documentation. Um, and, and Jesse has put a ton of work into doing that and we are forever grateful. So knowing that though, I, I think that there are still things that just need to be done and it doesn't necessarily coincide. It's like buying a car. That's not a therapeutic process, but, but there's just stuff that needs to be done. So you got to sign your consent. You have to ask certain questions. And I think for, for me, and I can only, again, speak, you know, for what, what has worked for me and what I witnessed working for some of my team members is that being just very transparent about that, just being transparent about the fact that this is the system, man, and this is the, we have to do this. And I'm sure you, you probably already do this, but, and saying, I'm going to give us 10 minutes. <laughs> we are going to get this stuff done today. And it isn't going to feel, we're not going to really connect. And I'm not going to make a ton of eye contact because I have this other monitor where I have to be typing today. And when the 10 minutes are up, I want to connect with you. I want to learn about you. I want to know who you are. This is not treatment. This is just the stuff we have to do. So let's do it. Let's get it done. And just being really transparent and kind of um, acknowledging it and validating and owning it. And then and then moving through and just trying to be as sort of efficient as you can. It's not it's not a solution, but it's my approach. I actually do when I when I do my my initial evaluations, I'll say to someone, "There's a, there's a bunch of questions I have to have for the document so that your insurance covers this this, this visit. I want to get those out of the way so the last part of the conversation is about you and I and how we're going to proceed with your care. So if you can just bear with me for for ten minutes, then we'll then we'll we'll move on to the stuff that that is most important. So thanks. Uh, the next question, I, I can help just a little with it, maybe, uh, if you're not comfortable with it, but I, I know just enough of, to be dangerous. 
The question is, how are the insurances doing as far as reimbursement for virtual visits? Um, the, very well for behavioral health, and that's been continued um, that behavioral health will be fully covered. So substance use disorders and mental health visits. And if I say anything that's wrong, Gordon, you can go right in and correct me, <laughs> but it are fully covered. The problem that we still come across is that in Cumberland and Penobscot counties, we still have some restrictions um, around telehealth for Medi Medicare billing. Um, and that is CMS driven. Um, and it's because those counties are considered to have more access to uh, medical resources. Although we who live in the state of Maine know that that is not the case. And so we do struggle because what, what if they're covered, but the facility fee, which is, you know, the, is the, look at the, the operational fee attached to medical visits doesn't get billed. And that can be a, a kind of a, a make or break for a, a program. Um, so that's still a challenge for us. It, it doesn't really make any sense because the operational uh, burden of managing telehealth is not less than the operational burden of managing an in-person visit and all of the metrics and processes are the same. If anything, it's a little bit more operationally driven. So though, I, I don't know, Gordon, if you have anything to add to that, but that's my understanding of where we're at. Well, that's what, the, what, what little I know, I know that during the, the pandemic, there were provisions that, uh, um, that required that, that the same reimbursement be paid for virtual visits as in-person visits. I don't know the extent to which those have been extended into the current period of time. I recall too that, that Senator, Senator Dr. Gratwick had legislation that also passed that, that put Maine really at the top of the list in terms of the ability to do telehealth from in Maine and to be paid for it. But that's not to say that each insurance company can't make it a little more, can, can put some barriers down just as they do in, in you know, we've had mental health parity uh, legislation for 25 years and it's um, every day I get complaints. Um, so it's getting better is I think the way that I would leave that. Yep. Um, the last question um, that we have is from my friend, Dr. Alberg and Jeff asked uh, another good question. In-person visits allow the logistics of a care team to occur, such as a clinician handing off to med, med management, perhaps to case management. How do you connect the team members in, in real time when you're virtual? I've got, Lisa Jacobs. I've got this one all over the place. So when I started with, for example, when I started at Eastport, I, 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 went, I went into the first staff meeting and said, you know what, I'm approachable. Anytime you have a question, I would prefer to Zoom. And, and so they, through Eastport, they'll put the referral in as a doctor's order, but then they'll uh, well, I'll set up a time to quickly Zoom with them, have a conversation, tell me about your patient, I'll take a little notes. And the reason I do this, not only does it allow for me to have a conversation with the primary care provider and, and provide education. They're learning, they're getting more comfortable taking back their patients because we're having these kind of reciprocal uh, relationships. But not only do I get that information, see the face-to-face -face and do the handoff, I can actually say to your patient, oh, I met you. I, I already spoke with Dr. Samus about you. We had a wonderful conversation. I'm very looking, I was looking forward to meeting you. And so the from that first appointment with Eastport Healthcare, we have established a environment where you just have a, you have a face to face with Lisa and tell her about your patient. I, we we just incorporated a new LCSW in um, Eastport that is just starting, and I, I'm meeting with her at the end of every day and saying, "Hey, you're going to see my patient next week. This is what I know about them," so that she can also have that same response that same response to them. Oh, I already talked to your provider, not. I saw the, the doctor's order. So it's, it's a culture, it's a culture of reciprocity. And I would like to add that Lisa is in South Bend, Indiana doing this and the LCSW she referenced is in Tennessee. In Tennessee. So, and uh, they, uh, 
from Washington County. But also from Washington County. <laughs> Washington County for the win. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, I, and I, I will say also that we always, when we onboard new folks to do telehealth, we talk with them about making, and we talk with the practices to make sure that we are invited to all of the staff meetings and the practice meetings. And not only that, but they give us video in those meetings, not just audio, and that they give us a couple minutes on the agenda to talk about something, some sort of behavioral health something. There's always, just so everyone remembers who we are, that we're part of the team and um, are integrated. We also use all the same workflows and processes um, as the other folks that we never ask for anything special or different so that we are just a member of that team. When our teams meet and we do a Zoom meeting, we, we don't have them block out their faces. Even if you're eating, we get to see that you're eating. You know, it's, it's never the, the generic screen. So it's, we're always constantly teaching about engaging people. Because if you teach, like I said, if you teach your employees and you take care of your employees, the rest of it works out. So they learn to do that with, with patient care as well. So I did find a, an additional question um, and it's a, it's a good one. Uh, it says, good afternoon. What are the requirements for working for your agency? Is there a residence requirement? I, I think that Lisa's pretty much answered that, but um, the patient, where, where would we find residency requirements? Mm. The patient has to be located in the state of Maine to do telehealth. So mm -hmm. it's about where the patient is physically located and the provider has to be licensed in the state of Maine. Um, that's it. So you can be where you're sitting, doesn't matter. There's differences with different countries. There's different kinds of agreements and I can't speak to those um, because I know there's some countries you can practice from and some you can't. Um, we don't have anyone from outside of the United States on our team. So I haven't had to figure that out too much yet. But I do know that it's where the patient's bottom is, is where you can see the, pa where you uh, are, are able to see the patient. We have a practitioner in Idaho that she, her, in Maine, she starts at 7 a.m., but she starts at 4 a.m. her time, so. It's um, it's quite an amazing thing, really. Yeah, she, I, yeah, I'm not sure lovely. that when I- Lovely. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure when I started with the Maine Medical Association 40 years ago that I would have anticipated being able to moderate a discussion with one provider in South Bend, Indiana, who's a regular practitioner in Eastport, Maine, with other team members that she's supervising all over the United States. So um, there are good things about this, particularly as we have this acute works workforce shortage. There's no yes. question about it. Well, I, have to also, say, you know, I have to say, I've been so far this year. I've been on a lobster boat. I've been in a, a dump a dump truck, a payloader, and I also got the chance to walk along the um, Eastport Ocean and see that the cruise ship was in. So it's been quite phenomenal. So it's been a very, very good experience. So we've got just two minutes. I, I wanna thank all three of our panel members, um, really enjoyed the information and I'm sure our audience did as well. I also wanna thank, uh, Josh Miller, our opioid response project manager. Uh, Josh is the, the handsome young man you see here and uh, uh, on the screen. And uh, he makes this these monthly webinars very, very easy for me, uh, as does Lorena at uh, AdCare. I can't thank them enough. Uh, I checked the calendar. I think the next uh, program is like January 7th, I think is that Friday. And um, we'll have something of interest, I promise you that. I remind you, we record all of these webinars are uh, recorded and available to you on the AdCare website. If you're getting CME credits, you need to return the evaluation form that you'll receive in an email shortly and then uh, and pay the $25 fee and then you'll get your CME certificate. So uh, we won't see you till the new year. Thank you for all the work that all of you do it's still a very dangerous time out there. Uh, still lots of overdoses and we have to do everything we can to try to help people and care about them. And I appreciate the work. Have a great weekend, everybody.